The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. If you've got an idea you'd like to see built, why not send it to The Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In this episode, I'm going to be addressing something that's been bugging me for years, hotel alarm clocks. You go to one hotel, it's got one kind of alarm clock, you go to another hotel, it's got a different kind of alarm clock, and you have to spend minutes, if not several minutes, sitting there figuring out how it works, hoping the alarm's set so you'll make the meeting in the morning, and I'm sick of it. What I propose is that we design a universal alarm clock that should be in every hotel in the world, or at least the country. So what we're gonna do today is build that, but we'll start by looking at an existing alarm clock and talk about the things about it that I don't like. So here's an example alarm clock. This is mine from home. It's a really bad example. Well, it's a good example of a bad one. I mean, look at this. It's hard to grip. You know, you've got to grab it like this way and then you, there's too many buttons to control it and the snooze button's small and the buttons are kind of hard to push. And like, you know, you can't just push the button because it, it moves, see? And like, what about an older person? You know, they might have less manual dexterity in their hands. They'd have a hard time with an alarm clock like this. So the idea is to make an alarm clock that has big buttons that's easy to use, not dinky buttons and hard to use. Although it does make a good iPod charger. So our plan is to make a super alarm clock or an alarm clock that has the features that I want. But that might also be useful for other people. So there's some basic parts to it. Part one is going to be the display. We want like a fairly decent display, you know, so you can see it from a distance maybe across the room or you know you're walking around at night without your glasses on and you're wondering exactly at what time you woke up in the middle of the night to go get a glass of water so it's not gonna be actually this big but nice big display maybe we could use like some dot matrix is or something so instead of like an LED you know where it's like that seven segment we do a dot matrix like a pinball machine you know for some reason I'm familiar with that and I like it so big ass display and then Maybe a day indicator, you know, just like some LEDs, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then so the clock knows what day of the week it is, so it doesn't sound an alarm on the weekends. Um, then the next thing would be an input device. And I'm thinking a big wheel, right, like this. And it's, we use a rotary encoder, which is not like a potentiometer, it's like a clicky. It's what would be on your car stereo when you turn the dial. You know how the dial is continuous? It doesn't have a beginning or an end, that uses a rotary encoder. So we have a rotary encoder which can be used to set the time easily and then maybe it clicks in as well. So you go click, click, right? And my thought is, you know, if an older person is using an alarm clock, you know, you know, if they have arthritis or some sort of, you know, manual dexterity impairment, you know, holding down a button and clicking another button, that might be difficult for them, so make it easy. And the third part of this would be some sort of brain and a real-time clock. So we have um, some sort of microcontroller, I suppose, since you know we use them all the time and they're easy. Microcontroller, maybe uh, some sort of memory, real-time clock, like we used on Aaron Matthews' hand sanitizer project. So this controls this and then this drives this. So I've been wanting to build this thing for a while. I've accumulated most of the parts, so I've just got to dig them up. Super clock bin, this is probably it. Oh, two rotary encoders, nice. Uh, what else we got in here? Get everything I need to make a real-time clock. So even with the battery removed, it'll, or the power outage, it'll still remove the time. Yeah, looks like I got most everything I need right there. All right, uh, got some LED matrices here. As you can see, I was trying to do something with them, but I can just pull this apart. Got another one here, so I think what I'll do is make these in a line, so like a big fat display. And then finally, I've got these little circuit boards I made. These are actually for the Parallax propeller, and uh, it's actually got everything we need. You can put the microcontroller there, we could put an SD card there if we wanted. Uh, yeah, so we could use this as a brain. And then the real-time clock, when we did Aaron Matthews' project, the hand sanitizer, that actually ran it for propeller, so we can just reuse that code and we'll be right up and running with that.
I've wired the LED matrices to uh, some PCB and I put a bus in, see that? Now how this is going to work is like this. We're going to drive one entire row at a time, like this, and then we drive the next one and the next one and the next one. You actually can't drive all the LEDs at once in a display. They actually are flickering, which is called matrixing. Because if you drove them all, it would basically take too many connections and too much power. So it's really gonna just light one and go really quickly. So using this pin out here, we identify where the grounds are. So there's going to be seven different grounds and we have them as a bus. So each of the ground, each of the seven grounds in the modules go to this bus. So we drive the high current here to light up the things and then by selecting which ground is active, that is which row will be on at a time and those will go faster than the eye can see. All right, here's our LED matrices and here's how we're going to drive them. So these, this bus here, see how the seven lines? That indicates the rows. So these are MOSFETs and we're gonna bring positive five voltage into them, but then only, only one of them is triggered at a time. So it activates which row lights up. And then here we have Darlington transistor arrays. And these will allow the dots to um, sync to the ground. And these will actually be what's hooked up to the microcontroller. So the microcontroller will ping these to say which row to light up. And then it'll activate these to say which dots in the row light up. And we're gonna use something called a Johnson counter to cycle through these so it uses less pins because we're gonna be very short on pins in this thing. Okay, we got our Johnson counters in from Element 14. So I'm actually gonna go to the Newark site, Newark slash Element 14, and look at the data sheet so we know how to use these counters. That's a great thing about these websites. Um, you can think of them as giant data sheet repositories. Here we go. Okay, so we scroll down here and we look at the pinout and then we can figure out how to hook this up to our device. So what this does is every time we clock it, one of these outputs goes high. And um, basically you go clock and the high output goes doot, 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 doot. It just kind of cascades down. So how that's going to work in our project is this is going to tell the LED display which row is active, right? And instead of having to use multiplexing, we should use multiple pins. We only need two pins for this. Clock and reset. So we clock it, you know, seven times to light up the rows, and then once we've done with that, we reset it so it goes back to the beginning. We don't have very many pins left over on that microcontroller out there, so we have to use this solution to use as few external pins on the microcontroller as possible. All right, I've got uh, my little development board for the propeller here, and it's driving the Johnson counter. And this oscilloscope will give you a good demonstration of what it's doing exactly. I can hook up the first two lines and we'll see them on the screen. Okay, see that? Once it stabilizes. There we go. So one of these is triggered and then the next one's triggered and the next one triggered. Of course, we only see the first two here. So it counts, counts down. It goes ding, 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 ding. So you're telling it which row to activate and it only uses two wires to do that. Clock and reset and it resets after it does the first six. Ever want to be part of an exclusive group? Or maybe you're just like me and want to have lots of groupies. Either way, Element 14 has something special for every engineer thanks to groups at element14.com. Element 14 groups are the place where you'll find engineers talking about all the things they care about, from embedded system designs to advanced lighting, robotics, and literally hundreds of other areas of engineering. We know that engineers and hobbyists like to drill down to the specific areas they're interested in, and at Element 14, you'll be able to find every area of engineering you can imagine. Search for groups under the Groups tab, or browse a list of featured groups on the community homepage at element14.com. Groups allow you to join discussions, watch videos, discover the latest news, collaborate with other members, and more. Community members can join as many groups as they'd like and can contribute to them through discussions, blogs, documents, and polls. Don't see a group you're looking for? No problem, just join Element 14 and you can start one yourself. Join Element 14 and gain access to all the community has to offer. Now, back to the show. Okay, so now the Johnson counter is being pulsed and activating these rows. Right now we're just sending all ones, all high to um, it, but you can see how the rows are being addressed. And what we do is we can take out the delay and then it'll run full speed and they'll appear to be solidly on. Although they're not gonna be terribly bright until we do this in machine language. All right, now I've got the program written in machine language so it's a little faster with the propeller. It's got multiple cores, so one of the cores can just sit there pumping the data out while the other seven cores can keep track of time, make graphics, make digits, etc. 
So this is using something called multiplexing. It's where you only light up one row of LEDs at a time and then you switch the rows faster than the eye can see. Um, so these appear to be solid on, but if we hook it up to the scope, we can see that each line is actually triggering with a frequency of approximately 60 hertz. So it's kind of like a high speed uh, television or a video game. And a little faster would be better, but this is probably good enough for now. Okay, now it's time to make the numerals. We're going to do that using just some data arrays in the uh, program itself. So here on the split over here, I can program it. So a zero, then I advance in memory to make a one. Now that we've got the um, matrix working, we can add the real-time clock, or RTC. A real-time clock is an integrated circuit that keeps time, obviously. And it needs a couple extra components, though, to actually work. It needs a battery so it can retain the time when the power is off. And it also needs an external crystal for the timing purposes. But then once it's you know, up and cooking, your microcontroller can access it any time. This particular one uses I squared C uh, protocol and retrieve the time from it. Right now it's running in 24 hour time, so I've got to change the bit for that. But uh, we're just using this little display here to show that we are getting data off of the real time clock. So it's got hours, minutes, seconds, and then the date. Now, as we mentioned in the Aaron Matthews episode, this uses um, binary coded decimal. So the clock doesn't give you the number 25 for the minutes, for instance. It actually gives you two and then a five which makes it easier for our purposes because instead of having me to slice the number 25 up into two digits to send to our display, it gives us the digits one by one. The real-time clock basically outputs this data in a way that makes it easy to put on a you know, character, 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 character display. So I've modified the real-time clock code from the Aaron Matthews project. Now I'm going to rewrite it a little bit. So instead of displaying it on this little debug LCD, they'll display it on the LED matrix that we made. It was pretty simple to change from outputting to this to that, so let's upload the new code. There's the time, 1020. Guess my wall clock's a little slow, but uh, yeah, there it is. Now we just need to add some controls and make a cool um, enclosure for it and some easy to use knobs. So I decided to rebuild the LED display on Superclock. The LED matrix, it was kind of cool, but it was a little too big and sort of hard to read, so I've just used some traditional LEDs here and I've got a little shield here for the clock that I built. So put this in place. So a few months ago I made this little uh, propeller breakout board where you can put your propeller microcontroller in there and you know use it for whatever. And so I put an extra one of these in the clock. So we've got the brain here, the real-time clock battery, real-time clock, and then I wired up an LED display using a whole bunch of shift registers. Not really the best way to do it, but I did it using parts I had laying around. So it's gonna have the time, it's gonna blink, AM, PM, and this is the day of the week. One of the gimmicks with this clock is it knows what day of the week it is, so it doesn't try to wake you up on a Saturday. The thought was, you know, usually on alarm clock, you're having to go like, click, 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 and it's kind of cumbersome. This one's like, you could do this with oven mitts on. In fact, we'll prove it. All right, so we plug this in to drive the display. And here's the controls. This has also has a plug. It's good to have plugs. It takes a little bit longer, but that way it's easy to take apart and it's more modular when you build it. And then we just put this down here and it should be ready to rock and roll. Look at the standard alarm clock. I'm gonna to try to program it with an oven mitt on. It's impossible. But with super alarm clock, it's easy. Just push the big obvious button and you're changing the hours. Push this in, you're changing the minutes. Push it in again, you're changing the day of the week. Then once you're done, push the button and the time is set. Yes, of course. It's so easy a child could do it. Is that, Jim? That's all the time we have for today. Stay tuned next time for our Halloween special. Woo! We'll spook you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.